Hey, what's up? Ron here. In this watercolor lesson, we'll paint together this heron or an egret. I'm not sure one of these two. Uh, and this process is a great showcase for some of the challenges you encounter when you paint watercolor. And I will show you the technique of putting down an even wash that is very challenging when you have this large shape to paint around. We'll also talk about contrast and how important it is to get just the right amount, how to hint at details instead of spelling them out for the viewer and how to make corrections. All of that in today's tutorial, let's get to it. So the key part of this tutorial is actually this stage and it's the one I want to put the most emphasis on. Uh, this part of painting the background is very demanding. Uh, I want you to focus hardest on this one. Uh, and notice just how long it takes for me to mix the paint because I'm very aware of the fact that it may run out and I have to make sure I mix enough. And to top it off, this wash does get quite dark in some spots. Uh, and so I need to make sure really that it's dark enough, strong enough, which it wasn't, by the way, spoiler alert, I had to go back and add some more details. I will also apologize, you may hear uh, Bambi, the little dog we're fostering, uh, do doing a foster care for a while in the background, uh, him and Ruth are playing. Uh, so a big part of this is one, as I said, mix enough paint. Two, you want to have your paper at an angle. I ensured that the paper is in a pretty steep angle. So about 20 degree, yeah, that's steep for me. Uh, and, and you want this wash to be juicy. What do I mean by that? Yes, you need a lot of paint to get it to be dark enough in some spots, but you also need a lot of water. And that is key to get it to flow. So a lot of paint, a lot of water. Now, what I'm doing here is alternating from that yellow to a green. One thing that you'll notice I wasn't accurate at all with is the colors. My colors are kind of systematically more bright and kind of more childish, childish. And if there's one thing I would have wanted to fix here is for them to not be that way. Uh, so maybe I will do another attempt, but for now, this is what we got. I went a little too strong on them. Uh, now notice I'm doing wet and wet to get that section to be darker. Uh, now the paper is so wet that in order to get this to be dark enough, you need to come back with almost thick paint in your brush, like almost straight out of the well. You have to understand that's the only way to combat the wetness on paper. And while you're doing all of that, you always have the edge in mind. You are always aware that the edge is drying and you need to pick up the pace. Now, what you see me do here is actually mixing a bit of opaque. <laughs> that's Ruth <laughs> and Bambi running around. You see me mixing uh, a bunch of opaque paint with my yellow there um, to kind of make a buffer between that and the blue. Uh, so it's funny, I don't show a lot of use of opaque paint, but you can kind of tell based on my brush that I mixed in, and it's the Joan Brilliant, the uh, <laughs> the, pa the paint uh, I use by Shinhan PWC, my favorite opaque uh, paint pretty much, the one I find most useful. Um, I'm using plenty of it here to create a buffer, again, between the yellow and the blue so that I don't get a green there, and you'll see it works really nicely. It's a technique I'll expand upon in the future. So now to start mixing my blue and to talk a bit about my colors, it's basically Indian yellow, um, uh, phthalo green, and now I'm using French ultramarine with a mix of my John Brilliant that you saw me add now. And look at how it makes the blue look a little more opaque, a little more, it mutes it on the one hand, but it doesn't lose a lot of its colorfulness. And that's actually a nice color. I feel like I matched the color in, in the blue, in the instance of the blue, pretty nicely here. Okay, now here we're getting really to be in the thick of it. This is where you really have to be careful with the wash so that it doesn't dry on you. Here's one factor that really plays in our advantage now. This part, the right side to the right of the wing is very thin. So at least we're not dealing with two wide parts of the wash. One is thin and it's pretty easy to go through uh, while the others are more open. Here we're dealing with three areas, right? To the left of the neck, between the neck and the wing and to the right of the wing. And all of these need to be taken care of um, individually, and it, it's just a part of it, right? So here I'm adding a bit French ultramarine. This was too much. This is too French ultramarine. Should have made it more neutral. This is where it gets a little um, too kind of childish, in my opinion, and too, for my taste. But color matching and color awareness is, is a skill I'm still working on developing, so I'm not going to be too harsh on myself um, for that. Now, I'm looking forward to closing this section as fast as I can so that I can move on to the rest, because the rest of the sections are where the wash continues, right? And 
I, I want you to find your own balance of speed because on the one hand you want to be fast enough so that the paint doesn't dry. On the other hand, you kind of want to get the shapes in accurately. You don't want to just run through them and, and have an ugly, unclear result. Right, so it's about all about finding that balance of the the way it works for you. Some people can work much faster. I find that I really have to slow down in these sections. Now to talk a bit more about my tools and materials, the paper is a Saunders Waterford. The brush I'm using is a Lebenson brush. <coughs> it's it's one of my favorites. Uh, it's the I forgot the exact name. I think it's the large. Um, uh, mix. I'll, I'll, I can write it down in the description as always. It's actually the one I used, same one I used for the recent live stream, the latest live stream from uh, this Thursday. So uh, you can see it there as well. Um, and I talk about it in many other videos. It's very useful for large washes, smaller, thinner, be, and be, when you need to be more accurate. I find these this brush to be great alongside other uh, brushes by Tracy. Um, I will probably use a bit of a Skoda too later on, though I'm not sure. These are my two go-to brands as of now. Now look at this, this is a bit too purple. So I'm gonna add a bit of uh, more uh, manganese blue hue, actually, in addition to French ultramarine. This is where I introduce it, it's the topmost left well. Uh, but it's still a bit, you see, it's, it's a very strong ultramarine. Uh, now, I ended up not being able to go dark enough or as dark as I wanted in this wash. I know it looks pretty strong and the contrast looks kind of in the ballpark, but it actually needs to be a little darker and I will show you later on. That's the trade-off with watercolor. When you go dark, it flows less and you lose some of its ability to flow. So you see, I'm, I really have to worry with this section. So then you have to worry, but you also have to mix dark paint. These two things don't work well together. And sometimes you have to resort to doing multiple washes as, as I always end up doing, you know, not always, but many times. Notice how you can also see my brush marks because I'm using fairly thick paint. Again, these are some of the disadvantages of using, using thick paint. Some people just paint by doing thin glazes. That's a possibility too. It maintains your flow. Uh, but you know, you find your own path. To me, I'm doing kind of a mix of both. I do like to get things as dark as I can, uh, as early as possible, just to get a fresher look in terms of the application of the paint, fewer glazes that run the risk of muting too much, even though that's not really my problem here. Uh, but yeah, so this concludes our first wash, the most challenging one. And now we're doing something very different. Now it's all about being accurate within that small shape of the heron or the egret. Again, not sure which bird it is. Um, so I'm starting and you'll notice that it has a blue tint to it, a very blue tint. So I'm using blue, uh, a combination of my manganese blue hue with a bit of my French ultramarine, with a bit of my John Brilliant. Uh, and I also added a bit of uh, red there. I think it was peril in red because it felt a little too blue. I wanted to turn it a bit more purpley. Uh, and then it ended up being too purpley, so I go back to blue later. But here it's really all about work slow, make sure to leave the necessary highlights. You'll notice there are pretty strong highlights around the neck of, of the bird. And also just generally, there are a lot of white parts. And the thing that will provide us that sense of light is putting in those uh, lighter, paler washes. That's kind of how it works. As you start adding different value schemes, the painting falls into context. And once this goes, you may notice that the background isn't dark enough and then you'll see me darkening it later on. Uh, now, there isn't too much variation in this section. It's pretty much just a blue kind of thing. Uh, but then as you move down, you'll notice because of some reflected light and all sorts of different environmental conditions, parts of the shadow on the bird or just the color of the bird um, are warm. So notice as I move into the center mass of the body, it is still cool, but the left where the wing is and the front of the main mass of the body, they're all warmer. And that's where I have to start introducing some yellow. So I'm starting to introduce some Indian yellow there to warm things up a bit in this region. And this play of warms and cools is where a lot of the beauty is gonna come from uh, in this particular work. Um, a lot of magic is in the subtleties and a lot of it is going to be here in those plays. One thing I lost with the background is that subtlety. I went for very bright yellows and very bright blues. And as time goes on, I realize, and now it's, I'm really starting to internalize this idea that that subtlety does matter. 
Um, and as long as you're focused on not just the values, it will be important to get some of it right. Now, just as important as these light pale washes is this part where it is a little darker. You see, it's where the, I guess where there's a bone in the wing or something like that. So it's much less, it's not transparent, right? The feathers are transparent, but this part is like muscle or bone. So it is not transparent. And, and so you need to show it as a dark area. Right, and then from that I pull out some shapes for the feathers where they uh, overlap and they're the centers of the feathers um, that do show. Uh, and and how do you get that feeling again of the white areas being lit and bright by adding those mid values? That's the the really the the main main way to uh, create that sense of light, right? Then if you if you feel like you didn't nail some aspect of the painting, ask yourself, am I missing something in the value scheme? Am I missing some darks? Am I missing some lights? I keep seeing this same mistake over and over, over and over again. People say they don't really like the way a painting looks. It's not impactful enough. It's not realistic enough. All they really have to do is darken some areas and that's doable. You can just do another wash on top of it. I, I see it all the time. Trust me, most people have the, this block of going, being scared to go dark enough. And it's just that. And as soon as you go as dark as necessary, it solves everything. Uh, and that's a, a, a correction that can be done to like 90% of the paintings I see. Uh, it's very hard to lift back lost highlights, but it's very easy to, you know, um, go darker. Now, if you look at the left wing, especially something interesting goes on there. There is a lot of reflections from the light that's coming from the water's surface. You see these ripples. This is a very something you see very frequently in pools and and you know you see it on people that are in the pool that kind of there's a light coming from the water's surface that is ripply and it um and it um it lights up anything that's close to the water's surface. In this case the the left wing to us it's the left wing to the bird it's the right wing. Right. And so I already drew this in advance. And by the way, sorry for not showing the drawing stage. Um, and I am just filling in the areas between where these highlights are. Now, I may have left them too light and maybe I should have gone over some of them, but it's fine. The effect isn't really lost and I can improve it by just going over some of those highlights and killing them, so to speak, and making them less uh, serious. Uh, but yeah, so I'm starting to add these in between. Um, jumping between warms and cools, though I should be more organized on a macro level, it should go from cool to warm or from warm to cool in a more organized fashion. You see now I'm jumping back to warm. It's something to be aware of. It's something I'm still not aware of, as you can see. Uh, it's something I'm working on improving in uh, one aspect that I'm working on improving. By the way, I think uh, May should come back home soon, so Ruth will probably cry and then we'll have some noise. So my apologies in advance. Maybe I'll pause the video or something. Uh, but yeah, so almost done with that wing. Now you'll notice something is still missing, and that is some of the darker parts on the bird itself. Uh, next to the beak, where the eye is, where the legs are. Don't worry, I'm going to add these on. And after we'll add these, we'll realize that we need some s more strength in the background. Um, and yeah, that's just that's just the process. You know, you won't get anything right the first time, at least not when you're getting started. That's fine. I mean, you can decide that it's right and that's perfectly fine. But if you if you're looking for that likeness and similarity and accuracy and values, it's very hard to get, it's very difficult to get get it right just the first time. So um, do the attempt uh, and, and try and slowly fix whatever needs fixing. Um, and just being frustrated over it is usually not as useful. So um, don't worry, everyone goes through that. Uh, so now I'm mixing that thick paint for the uh, bird's legs. Um, zoomed in or maybe it's for the face because I'm zooming in on something that I want to see the details of. By the way, I love how the bird kind of bounces off the water surface and then you get to see some splashes. Uh, that's really nice and it is something I wanted to capture. Uh, it's actually something I didn't plan in the drawing stage and next time I will pay more attention to these kinds of things. Uh, I kind of just added it later on with paint, uh, but that's fine. Um, as for drawing, uh, you can trace if you want to be really accurate uh, or you can just draw it slowly. You can use the grid method, whatever it is. I do encourage people to work on the drawing skills. I think it is important, very beneficial. Uh, it just gives you more freedom to change things around, to 
to draw whatever you want. You can paint from uh, imagination. You don't need much of a drawing actually to paint from imagination. Something I'm coming to realize recently. So onto the beak and those dark spots uh, on the face. I'm gonna get that iris and the part around that. Uh, forgot the perfect eye terminology, not sure about that. There's a, this dark stripe and then I'm off to using yellow. Um, so I'm gonna make some Indian yellow, very pure. I want it very pure and uh, untainted by other colors. And you'll see, I think I did a decent job at that. Uh, and it may need a bit of red just to turn some of it a bit more orange feeling. So here we go. Put that in. And remember, a lot of the paint that you put in can be fixed. If you don't like something, you can lift back. You can do a lot of things. Nothing really is lost, at least not immediately. Uh, there's a lot you can fix and you notice there are quite a lot of inaccuracies here I did not do a perfect job with this wash uh, or any of the washes, but it still look, it looks decent um, Animals it's still a subject sometimes I'm having a hard time with honestly I feel like I'm still a bit too illustrative in my approach I still have a hard time detaching from what I think it looks like and actually painting it like what it looks like looking at the values more cleanly looking at the colors more cleanly um, rather than seeing a wing seeing shapes uh, it's something pretty significant I'm working on improving uh, and it's a slow progress it really is just it takes time uh, lifted back some of these uh, shapes that were left uh, starting to add a few more dark touches here and there where I see them. <coughs> By the way, I, there's a face in the third uh, mixing area from the top. Look at the, there's, it looks like there's an eye and another eye to the left top, then a big dark nose in the background, red lips, that's creepy. Oh man, now I see the left eye too. Oh, now it's gone because I just cut the video on the mixing. Uh, but yeah, so now what you'll see me do is a bit of a risk move, but I'm gonna darken the background. Now, the background is smooth. It is done with wet paint. How do you get that same smoothness? You have to blend your edges. So let me show you the technique. It's not the easiest, but I'm gonna go back, use a wet brush and kind of smoothen that edge. I'm gonna do the same for the top edge as well. Now this paper is pretty good, but you do run some risk of lifting what's underneath. So you have to be very fast in terms of blending edges when it's not the first layer, okay? Something to pay attention to. The 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 Or was it, oh yeah, this, so I'm not sure now. Was it, did I use Bocking Ford here? Or I can actually check because the painting is right next to me. Just give me a second. Okay, I can't find the painting, that's strange, but I, I will check back. Uh, the paper, I'm not sure what it was, but it does feel like some of it has lifted, so I do suspect, yeah, it is, it is. So this is Bockingford, St. Cuthbert, uh, Bockingford paper. It's good, it's pretty good quality, but it still feels like I'm, and you can see this by the uh, perforated top uh, part, it does feel like it can lift back some areas. So you have to be a little careful there. Now I'm gonna continue with this motif and move on to some more dark areas. You see that there's an area around the head of the bird and then once again below that. Now here I'm gonna do something a little different. I'm pre-wetting. So notice I'm doing it real fast. I'm pre-wetting with just one brush stroke. Otherwise you will reawaken some stuff there and you don't want that to happen. Now there's quite a lot of opaque paint there just cause I like the way it looks, but I think it doesn't really serve my needs here that well. I just kind of used it cause it looked pretty, but that's fine. Um, so yeah, putting in those shapes once again cause I didn't get it dark enough the first time. This is really where masking fluid could be a good idea, I guess. Uh, even though, what are you gonna do, mask the entire bird? Or maybe you'll mask just the parts that are um, uh, fully white. I don't know, I'm not sure because if I could mask the bird, it would have been much more effective. I would have gone, gotten that first wash just the first time, no problems at all, as dark as it needs to be. I could probably have been more focused on the colors in that case too. 
No, but that's fine. Um, so yeah, just just an interesting thing to think about. And here I go pushing that bottom part as well, using a bit of neutral tint here, by the way, to get it dark faster. Uh, so I recently purchased some neutral tint. Finally, I find it very useful. Um, well, you know, I'm not a big fan of black colors, but I find that, I mean, just pure pitch black because I find that it, it lacks a bit of the other colors of my palette. Uh, if I'm doing uh, black and white work, it's perfect. Uh, I have no problem with if I'm doing monochromatic, I'll use black color for the whole thing. I love it. But in the context of a painting, I find that black colors can kill off the color harmony sometimes, but the neutral tint actually did a decent job of preserving whatever was working in the color harmony and kind of just darkening neutrally. <laughs> so it does the, the trick, I guess. So that's fine. Still getting used to it though. Now everything is dried, okay? It gave it some time. And what I'm gonna do now is uh, start adding a few ripples, very few. So you'll see, because you can see them, they're lighter. Uh, this is where using opaque paint gets into the picture. What you see me here is really mixing a lot of the opaque paint with very bit of uh, my blues. Uh, what this does is it just painting with opaque paint. It's just like that if you were to use acrylics or anything else. However, it is still watercolor. And what does that mean? It means that it will dry lighter, basically, well, darker in this case. So it's, it's really weird, but when you first place that mix, uh, it will look very light, and the reverse happens from normal paint. It dries darker. So sometimes it'll disappear even if you didn't use enough opaque paint. So it's a balance that is a little hard to get at first, and I'm still learning it. But just be aware that when you're mixing an opaque watercolor with another opaque. I don't know if other gouache or other things, I don't know how they behave, but I can only speak to opaque watercolor. When you're mixing opaque watercolor with uh, other, and here I am using my white gel pen, with non-opaque watercolor, uh, you need to get it quite uh, strongly on the opaque side. Otherwise it will just dry dark and it sometimes will disappear and you'll see just that darker layer underneath. So just something to have in mind. Um, I find that this is really good for the dots. Here's the final result by the way, scanned, so higher quality and here it is up close. I decided not to add too many details to the feathers as you can see, I just kind of kept it uh, like that and I hope you like it and now let's wrap it up. So thank you so so much, I hope you enjoyed this lesson um, and I hope that seeing all of these challenges, especially in the beginning stages and then later on, and not being scared to add more and make the corrections that are possible, not shying away from opaque paint. It can be very useful sometimes. I hope all of that works well for you. And if you have created it, please share in a comment down below. You can let me know where to find it, maybe Instagram or a link or whatever, if you can. I'm not even sure they allow it. I would be curious to see your uh, version or you can share it in the Discord. Other than that, if you do want to learn how to let go, enjoy the painting process, be sure to check out the Frustration Free Watercolor course. It will allow you to get this kind of a result. Let go, paint freely, and also learn how to use the techniques properly. Get an even wash, mix the right value, mix the right color to some extent. Um, and I think you'll find it very useful. Link is always in the description box below. I am working on a new course on realism and watercolor. This one will be out soon. I will keep you posted. Thank you so much. We'll see you again in the next video.